a very uh, <laughs> it is indeed uh, a very warm welcome to um, our first CJS and POW seminar of the series. We are delighted today to welcome here to, to uh, UEA, all the way from Pitsumeka and Kyoto, uh, Paulina Ivanova, who is senior, um, senior researcher at the Asia Japan Research Institute of Pitsumeka and University of Japan. She holds a PhD in international relations from Pitsumeka as well, and her interests lie in migration and migrant integration. Um, and Paulina has written a number of, of very important pieces, including two standout books, one of which is Civil Society and International Students in Japan, and the other forthcoming, or very, very soon to be out, I believe, is um, East Asia Perspective, or oh, sorry, is um, the making, uh, is, oh, sorry, Refugees and Asylum Seekers in East Asia, um, which is coming out in uh, 2024, so this year, um, and she's going to speak on that. So, it's, so we're speaking today on refugees and asylum seekers in East Asia, Asia from the perspectives of Japan and Taiwan, and this is co-edited with Lara Momeso. Mm -hmm. So, it should be a really, really interesting session. This is a this is a unique and very valuable opportunity for those who are here today to listen to, to Pauline live and also to be able to ask questions um, and get her insights here while she's with us. So please do uh, listen carefully and um, offer some, some questions and make the most of this rare opportunity. And with that, I will hand over to Polina. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and the, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm going to talk about refugee regimes in East Asia using this specific uh, two case studies of Japan and Taiwan. And I'm going to use the framework of human security, which is one of the non-traditional security approaches uh, in the uh, IR or security studies. Uh, so my plan would be to talk about, uh, first of all, what refugee regime means. Perhaps not everyone knows. It's still a kind of uh, concept in the process of uh, development. And uh, I will talk about those two specific cases in a way you will see that they are quite different, quite contrasting, uh, especially in, when it comes to legal framework. And uh, yet you will see that it's also uh, kind of a paradoxical to what extent they uh, tend to merge when it comes to actually um, protecting and accepting people on the ground. So you will see how despite the differences in the legal uh, and policy side, uh, those apparent differences, uh, they don't differ as much uh, when it comes to actually receiving people on the ground. Uh, so. Building on these two East Asian uh, countries, I will make some very cautious generalizations for Asia, because Asia, as you know, is a very diverse uh, region. It's very hard to make a generalization, but I'll, I venture into this as well. And uh, next, we'll talk about national security, traditional security state-centered state versus human security and uh, the implications for refugees and asylum seekers of using or not using the human security uh, framework. Uh, again, as uh, you have heard, uh, my talk will largely be based on the forthcoming book, uh, which will be published in the second half of 2024. I am not yet able to tell you the exact date. Unfortunately, it's in the production stage, so not yet uh, known. Uh, but the good news is the book will be published open access, which means that anybody uh, who has internet connection and interest in this topic can download it and read entirely for free. So that is good, I think. And uh, we will have 15 chapters uh, divided into three main parts. And the first part will deal with legal and policy institutional frameworks. And second part will be on media representation of uh, those population groups and also public opinion in the so-called host countries uh, on them. And the third part will be on lived experiences. All right. Uh, so uh, first of all, what is refugee regime? So that was a key word in our title. And this um, uh, 
this concept was introduced uh, several years ago. But I'm personally relying on the definition of Alexander Betts uh, in his article in 20, of 2015, where he defines the refugee regime as uh, rules and norms entrenched in the uh, key international conventions, uh, key international treaties, convention, and the protocol relating to the status of refugees, and also decision-making procedures that uh, host states are using uh, in their response to refugees and of course the uh, main international organization the UNHCR. Uh, we have to mention here very quickly the convention's definition of a refugee because that's still the key international document that governs uh, the state's responses to them, uh, and it's still uh, being used by the UNHCR. So if you uh, read the definition here on your screen, I don't know if it's uh, very easy for you to read or not, I can read it for you. So it's someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. So here we have very specific reasons and also... Uh, the part that is often picked up by the countries that are using very narrow approach to this definition is the owing to well-grounded fear, well-founded fear. Uh, so it's it doesn't have to be some kind of fear just in my head or illusionary. It has to be well-grounded. So I have to uh, provide some proof that it's actually happening. And it's more uh, moreover, not just generalized uh, threat, but actually individualized. So that means that I, as individual, am at risk if I stay in this specific territory or country. So we will uh, talk about this uh, later, the implications of using this definition a bit later. Uh, moreover, we are going to talk about asylum seekers. And who are asylum seekers? They are basically people who are trying to be recognized as refugees. So here we have, again, definition by the UNHCR. So those who claim for refugee status, but uh, their claim has not been uh, yet finally decided on by the country in which the claim is submitted. Uh, so again, quite narrow definition that, that implies that the person should enter the country, should uh, uh, submit the claim in a some kind of uh, uh, formalized procedure, which, uh, as you can imagine, not always uh, you know how, where, in which way uh, you submit this claim, as oftentimes language is a huge barrier. So lots of things. Uh, UNHCR was, of course, very well aware of that. And in their uh, currently, um, uh, it, it's, it says ND in the citation because it's a constantly updated master glossary of terms. So in this uh, uh, glossary, they have a, an updated and expanded definition, which includes also people who have not submitted the application, but may intend to do so, or may be in need of international protection. So this is actually quite important because in reality, the distinctions are not so clear cut. They are quite blurred. And uh, a lot of people in what is called refugee-like situation in need of humanitarian protection, they actually may never apply for asylum. Uh, they may enter the country on a tourist visa, on um, some kind of uh, maybe spouse visa, trainee, student, working visa, or very frequently they may actually overstay the visa and become irregular or illegal uh, migrants, which is very often... Um, verbalized like this by uh, the uh, host state. So uh, let's talk about those uh, two case studies specifically. So uh, as I said, on the one hand, they look quite opposite. So Taiwan uh, is only partially recognized, as we know, because of the China's stance on that. And uh, for the same reason, it's a non-UN state as well. So as such, even though we all know that it's a de facto state, so it has government, constitution, currency, even postal stamps, army, everything as a state should have. Uh, however, it cannot officially accede to uh, those key international treaties that I mentioned, the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention and uh, the related protocol uh, of 1967. So even if they really, really wanted, they would not be able to uh, sign it because they are not recognized as a state officially and not, not UN uh, member. Uh, another thing which is not related to uh, this, but to the fact of being non-UN state, uh, is that they don't have domestic refugee law. This they could have passed. However, uh, the bill has been sitting in the parliament for years. Again, there have been political reasons for not pushing 
through because they uh, signed a number of conventions. They have law related to, I don't know, torture, human rights. And it's quite an advanced country when it comes to human rights in Asia. However, they are very cautious about refugee law because, again, of the uh, one China policy. They are afraid that if they start accepting uh, people coming from Hong Kong, Tibet, uh, officially as uh, refugees, that ha can have very serious implications with the PRC. So as a result, they deal with refugees and asylum seekers who are on their territory on a completely ad hoc basis, so individualized approach. So basically the person comes and they decide on the individual basis what to do with this person. Uh, they have, however, specific provisions for certain population groups, uh, for Tibetans, and again, in the book, we will have a whole chapter on how they deal with Tibetans. Uh, it has changed over the course of history. Uh, they had three different refugee regimes, three different approaches to uh, Tibetans, depending on the current ideology in Taiwan. Sometimes they saw them as a fellow countrymen, sometimes they saw them as somebody else, sometimes they were accepted as labor, uh, basically cheap labor, and then uh, normalized later, uh, provided some kind of uh, residence permit. And sometimes it was different. So Hong Kongers, again, after the political events in Hong Kong, they started accepting uh, activists uh, for citizens of China, particularly Macau, and also for Indo-Chinese boat people, which again, uh, we will see in the case of Japan, they also had uh, special provisions. So that was a major push for Japan to actually sign the convention and the protocol. So unlike Taiwan, you can see that Japan actually signed both treaties in uh, the early 80s. Uh, again, there may be a discussion if you are interested uh, how and why they did it, uh, there is a lot of argument they, they wouldn't have done it without, uh, first of all, objectively uh, speaking, those masses of people coming from the Indochina and uh, related international pressure particularly from the United States and from other Western countries as well, who started accepting them and argued that Japan should do the same. Uh, in addition, as we may know, uh, Japan has been a major contributor to the UNHCR for decades, uh, literally the second donor after the United States until, uh, I believe, 2013. And then, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the data for the last year, I just realized, but uh, because of the decline in economic power, it has started, you know, becoming like fourth or fifth uh, donor, but still it's quite a significant contribution. So that shows that uh, the Japanese government is taking the refugee issue seriously. Uh, however, it stands in sharp contrast with the extremely low uh, refugee recognition rate and uh, acceptance rate. So you can see some numbers on the screen. Wow, that looks quite quite shocking, right? Uh, and of course, that includes uh, this 915 people officially recognized as refugees, um, that, that is only officially recognized as convention refugees. So on top of that, we have people who were provided so-called humanitarian protection or who were accepted on some other types of visa. Again, in the book, we will have a chapter on uh, student uh, uh, refugees, the students who are or displaced learners, I think they are called displaced learners. So people from Myanmar, Syria, Afghanistan, and recently Ukraine, who came to Japan uh, through different provisions. So they are basically, they would have been recognized in any other country as, as a refugee. However, in Japan, uh, for example, Ukrainians were recognized as evacuees, hinanmin, instead of nanmin uh, refugee. So that is uh, one difference. And uh, as we will discuss later, it, it has implications. It's, it's not just a matter of terminology. It has uh, serious implications for people. Uh, so this is one uh, thing, the low recognition rate, low acceptance rate. Uh, and uh, also the second point for which Japan has been uh, fiercely criticized by both uh, international and domestic, uh, activists and uh, academics is the detention practices, of course. Uh, so first of all, uh, it includes indefinite detention period. So you can be kept in this detention center for indefinite period of time. So nobody can tell how long. Uh, there's no limit officially. And then the lack of transparency in the point of entry. It's not clear 
who and how and what kind of procedures are applied. Uh, and of course, uh, instances of human rights abuse, such as torture and several deaths in detention. And I will discuss a case of a Sri Lankan asylum seeker later. So all of that put together, um, I triggered a lot of um, criticism and uh, accusation of uh, practicing a checkbook diplomacy. So basically paying not to take responsibility and not to take um, asylum seekers inside the country. Uh, as I said, there is a similarity between how Taiwan and Japan actually uh, deal with asylum seekers. So the similarity is that uh, Claims uh, for asylum are also considered on an ad hoc individual basis, generally speaking. There are three exceptions. Uh, first, uh, those uh, Indo-Chinese refugees, the same boat people that I mentioned in the previous slide on Taiwan. Uh, second was a resettlement program. Japan was the first Asian country to run a resettlement program uh, of Myanmar refugees between 2010 and 2013. And then the program was actually uh, continued. So but the first uh, stage was those three years. And uh, the third uh, is the reception of Ukrainian evacuees. Again, as I said, that was a, uh, they were framed as a, a evacuees, not, a, not as refugees, and that has implications as well. Uh, if we speak of Asia in general, as I said, we should, of course, make generalizations with caution because the countries are quite different. However, there are some tendencies. So first of all, most uh, states or territories in Asia are non-signatories to the Convention and the Protocol. So specifically 36 uh, countries out of 51, which is majority. Right. Uh, secondly, there are no uh, special regional protection frameworks, unlike other regions of the world, such as Latin America or Africa. They have their own uh, framework, their own definition of uh, refugee, and uh, that applies to uh, the uh, refugees and asylum seekers within the region, and that makes it easier to accept them locally. And of course, it doesn't apply for someone who would come to Latin America, let's say from Europe, right, or from other parts of the world. Uh, all right, so the third um, a tendency which we thought about when we were kind of putting this book together is the, that due to historical and cultural reasons, the principles of nationalism and state sovereignty are quite strong in the region. It's related to colonial history, decolonization for many uh, countries. And that is why a state interests often tend to be prioritized over human security. And I'm not saying that this is only Asia and not, uh, it does not apply to other parts of the world. However, it is certainly true for Asia. And for those two specific countries, if you think about them, what else do they have in common? They are both islands, right? So in a way that makes it much easier to close the border and control the border. Uh, so they are practicing what is uh, called active insulation. There are several ways how we can, we can control borders, and this is one of them. Uh, so it's uh, possible to do in any country, of course, but uh, within the landlocked country, it's done a little bit differently compared to the island, where it's simply easier to do this. And sec uh, second um, point related to this one is that um, citizenship is uh, determined by so-called the right of blood. So uh, that means it's determined by the parents' nationality. It's not by the place uh, where the person is born, which would be right of the soil, uh, for instance, like in the United States. Okay, so this is for Asia as a hosting region. So we are ready to move to the second part of our talk, uh, which is uh, traditional security versus non-traditional security. And there are many uh, different approaches to non-traditional security. So I will be only discussing today human security. And particularly because I come from a Japanese institution, I will be discussing their approach to human security. I will mention that there are other uh, ways. So if we speak about traditional security, clear what it is, right? So we have nation stand, state in the center and uh, national interests are governing uh, security um, choices. So in the case of Taiwan, it's clear that they are very concerned of uh, the one China policy of the PRC, and that actually restricts their choices in how they approach refugees and asylum seekers on their territory. All right. So in uh, the case of human security, the individual and not the state uh, comes to the center. And uh, even though the conversations about uh, limitations of uh, traditional human security started in 1980s, but it only came to the international policy agenda in 1994 with the UN Human De uh, Development Report. And it, it specified three pillars, uh, freedom from fear, freedom from want, 
and want here means economic right needs and uh, freedom to live in dignity another very important one uh, again there have been a lot of discussions about how well they complement for example uh, traditional security and Sadako Ogata who was a big proponent uh, back in the day when uh, she was uh, leading the UNHCR uh, said that according to her at least that complemented perfectly state security, not everyone would agree. Uh, there was also a discussion, uh, I would say, within the academia more and also within the uh, Canadian uh, versus Japanese understanding of human security, uh, to what extent uh, it uh, contradicts or complements human rights agenda. And uh, Canadian scholars uh, were saying that it can actually unwillingly undermine the human rights agenda. However, again, uh, we can find other scholars who believe that they complement perfectly, they kind of operationalize it, they make it more, uh, you know, because when we just uh, say about human rights, it can be somehow a bit uh, in the air, a bit lofty, but uh, if we have a um, human security agenda, it, it can make it very, very down to earth. Uh, so again, if we look at the case of Japan here, we can see a paradox because on the one hand, uh, it's such a pioneer, it, it, people did a lot, I mean, the government and the representative of, of Japan in the international organization, they did a lot to promote this idea internationally and they also uh, promoted it through JICA, through development, uh, through aid. Uh, However, when it comes to applying the same principles domestically to their domestic problems, such as, I don't know, environmental, poverty, uh, mental health, they are a bit more reluctant to apply the same principle and uh, not as good, I would say, that, uh, compared to um, international uh, kind of... Uh, move. I'm sorry, I don't know why it's not moving. It should be moving. Uh, all right, so let's discuss the implications of where, uh, what happens if we uh, take into account human security uh, for the refugees and asylum seekers and what happens if we do not. So first of all, if it's neglected, uh, it can uh, create this kind of uh, indefinite situation that we were already talking about earlier, can leave asylum seekers in the limbo, uh, some scholars called it protracted refugee situations. So that means that uh, when they apply for the asylum, uh, they can wait sometimes very long period of time. And what do you do within um, this period? Uh, you're not certain uh, and uh, you cannot uh, have uh, resources. You don't know whether you're staying in this country or you're going somewhere else. So you are waiting uh, to make some kind of important choices. And that can lead, uh, especially if a person is in um, some kind of temporary accommodation, not very uh, suitable for long-term life. It can uh, lead to breakdown in families. It can lead even to violence, uh, health problem, mental health, physical health, and uh, socioeconomic deprivation, of course, because we can only uh, survive up to a certain period of time. Uh, moreover, as I said, uh, unrecognized uh, asylum seekers may be detained, like in Japan, and deported if they are not, uh, if they cannot provide this um, proof of or evidence of uh, personalized threat that I mentioned before. Uh, also, unrecognized refugees, uh, even if the threat is not being questioned, but let's say if they are recognized as someone else, as uh, those students, for example, who come from Myanmar, Afghanistan, Ukraine, they are recognized as evacuees, for example, and that has implications because uh, they cannot access the same uh, social welfare benefits, they cannot bring their family members, uh, they cannot apply for resettlement uh, to a third country. So uh, those are only some implications for what it can mean, and of course it can also uh, lead to more dramatic cases. Uh, is anyone familiar with the Vishma Sandamali's case? No? I can briefly summarize this, the picture on the left. So you can see this poster, and uh, this is a protest happening in 2021. So she was a 33-year-old Sri Lankan woman who died in uh, Nagoya Detention Center. Uh, the situation was that she came to Japan in 2017, 
uh, as an international student. And she started uh, until 2018. Uh, I believe uh, after that, she wasn't able to afford her tuition fee anymore. So she dropped out and lost her student status. Uh, however, she stayed in Japan and started working as, in a factory uh, and living with her, with her boyfriend. Uh, after that, uh, she applied for asylum around the, the same time. Her uh, uh, asylum claim was rejected. And that happened in the end of 2019. And then if we remember what started happening in 2020, was the pandemic, right? So uh, she knew that she had to leave. However, she had no opportunity to do so because the border was closed and uh, the number of flights, uh, especially to Asian countries, were dramatically reduced. Uh, so she stayed and because of... Uh, all these difficult times, she started experiencing domestic violence from her partner and uh, came to the local police, Koban, to complain about uh, the domestic violence. Instead, the police sent her to the detention center as a visa overstay, because at that point, uh, her stay in Japan was technically illegal. Uh, so that what happened. And... Uh, in the detention center, she started developing physical symptoms uh, such as uh, stomach pains and uh, she was unable to swallow, nausea, things like that. And uh, she was provided some medical help, but not adequate. And she was also uh, through her lawyer, I believe it was someone, uh, 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 she applied for provisional release. However, her claim was rejected. And we also know that uh, because there was video footage of her last days in the uh, detention center that uh, they did not, did not believe that she was seriously ill. She, they believed that she was just faking it in order to get out of the prison. So as a result of all that, uh, she didn't receive uh, adequate medical help and uh, she died on uh, 6th of March 2021 in her prison cell. So that tragedy could have been avoided if they didn't have this uh, practice of uh, Detention, And I must say that this is not the first uh, case of death in the detention center in Japan. However, that uh, one was picked up by local and international human rights organizations. So you can see this poster and maybe you can even recognize the line uh, using say her name is the same uh, lines that were used for Black Lives Matter movement. Right. So it's sort of uh, you can see some example of transnationalism here. So how they reuse the practices. And of course, even though, yes, they're carrying her picture, it's impossible to obviously get her back, but it's possible to, uh, you know, prevent uh, such uh, cases uh, to happen in the future. So that is why they have this urge for change. So it's not just about her, uh, it's about uh, how Japan is treating migrants in general, uh, and asylum seekers in particular. Uh, all right, so this second picture is uh, actually taken in Taipei, the Asian network of women's shelters. So they are also commemorating her death and they are holding hands to like, show solidarity uh, because she uh, was perceived by the uh, women's movement as primarily a victim of domestic violence. All right, so this is what can happen. The kind of illustration what can happen if it's uh, if human security is not applied uh, what if it's applied uh, so one of the implications is that we can avoid uh, these uh, distinctions that are um, often made uh, between real or good or genuine refugees and bogus refugees you know some fake refugees sometimes we can hear this in the media or some kind of populist politicians and again, in the book, we will have a chapter on uh, Indonesian technical trainees. Has anyone heard about uh, technical tra trainee program that Japan has been running? It's also quite controversial because uh, it's especially being criticized a lot. Uh, ideally, they should um, provide training to workers from uh, South Asian countries. And this is what the program was meant to do. However, in reality, uh, they just recruit, you know, workers for very cheap prices, they, they exploit them and uh, send them back. So the workers are not able to, send, uh, to stay in Japan for a longer period of time. They are not able to bring their families. Uh, you, you know, it's a kind of, um, guest worker program, but at the same time, also with a lot of exploitation, a lot of human rights abuse. Uh, and we will have a chapter on this. And some of the asylum seekers, they chose this 
um, very unusual, uh, not very obvious strategy. So they apply for asylum in Japan as a strategy for them to just stay longer and work legally and survive. Uh, and also they think, oh, well, if I am recognized as actually asylum seeker, then I will be, uh, I mean, official refugee, then I will be able to bring my family finally, and they will be all well fed at least. Uh, so if we apply this kind of very traditional framework, then, you know, there's no war in Indonesia, there's no, I mean, there's some problems, but uh, it's, it's not very uh, likely to be thought of as a, a country of um, origin of refugees, right? So uh, in a way we can say, oh, they are not real asylum seekers. But if we think about them uh, in this sense of um, this human security framework and we think about those three pillars and one of them being freedom from want, and we think about the bigger picture in Indonesia, this huge unemployment, and then come back after technical trainee program, they don't have a job, they struggle. So the only survival strategy that they see is actually come back and apply for asylum, even though it, it sounds uh, quite, quite uh, you know, maybe, maybe surprising at the first. Uh, and we can see them that way as a survival migrants and hopefully have more empathy to their situation. All right, so uh, I wanted to talk about um, the local integration of refugees and asylum seekers. The reason uh, why I am focusing on local integration is uh, it's one of the three main solutions uh, for refugees, uh, for the UNHCR, because we all know uh, that living in a camp is not a durable solution, right? You cannot live in the camp for long period of time. So what do we do? Uh, it's first possibility is voluntary repatriation. Voluntary is the key word here. So if it's uh, being, you know, forced on the person, then it's not voluntary. So it's only when it's safe to do so. Uh, it's, it may be possible to return. Uh, then we have local integration and resettlement in a third country, a settlement we mentioned already. And local integration is important for those two cases because both Japan and Taiwan are quite well developed countries economically, and also they are, um, I'm looking at the time, yeah, I'm coming to the end. Uh, they are experiencing demographic challenges in the way of uh, uh, aging and shrinking population. So they would be actually in need of uh, people to come and fill in these gaps in labor uh, force. So that would be a win-win situation. Uh, however, local integration includes those three dimensions according to the UNHCR again. Uh, first is a legal dimension and if we read through the, what's written in this column, we can see that hmm, probably Japan and uh, Taiwan are not doing very well in this respect because uh, what should be happening ideally is that refugees and asylum seekers should uh, get a progressively wider range of rights, uh, ideally compar comparable uh, to those of citizens, and it should uh, lead, the process should lead to permanent residency and uh, citizenship. It's not happening very much, let's say. Uh, and uh, second is economic dimension. So refugees ideally should not rely on international aid or some kind of subsidies from the state. They should become self-reliant and contribute to the local community. And uh, the third part is social cultural dimension. Again, if we think about uh, how about discrimination of foreigners, how about exploitation? Well, again, we see some challenges there. Uh, all right, so here I wanted to bring up some uh, questions for discussion. So I uh, hopefully have shown that uh, despite differences in legal framework, which is missing in Taiwan for various reasons and is present in Japan, we have very similar outcome for refugees. We see very reluctant admission, protecting borders as much as we can and uh, letting as fewer people in as possible. So this is first part. And second, poor integration. Again, there will be a chapter on what's happening, for instance, of, uh, to those Ukrainians who arrived in 2022. And uh, I think 64% or even more are still without jobs, right? right? So that shows, of course, despite looking for them, right? So looking for jobs, they are not able to get a job, which shows that there are serious uh, issues of integration here. Uh, again, uh, does it mean that legal framework is useless? I hope not, but I would like to, you know, hear from you. 
uh, because there are some discussions definitely about uh, to what extent uh, UNHCR is useful, the convention is useful, maybe we should just reject everything and start from scratch. And uh, also what it means, what are the implications for society? There's uh, again discussion for uh, something that's called social license, right? So to what extent we want uh, as a society people to come and they can be uh, as refugees, asylum seekers, we are ready to accept them, or it can be social license can apply to other uh, spheres, um, social spheres, for example, like uh, international education as well, to what extent we are interested as a society to have international students in our community, not just seeing them as source of income, but also as human beings. And uh, I am uh, doing another research right now on loneliness, among international students in the UK and Japan. And the reason I chose those two countries is again, uh, because they uh, put loneliness on their uh, national policy agenda. Those two countries uh, appointed ministers of loneliness, uh, UK in 2018 and uh, Japan followed suit in 2021 uh, after some implications of the onset of the pandemic. Uh, so, they are recognizing the importance of loneliness on the societal scale. However, the policies are still targeting uh, citizens or local nationals primarily and foreigners, including refugees, asylum seekers, international students and other categories often remain uh, neglected minorities. So this is something I'm doing as well. So seeing the human kind of aspect of uh, foreigners, regardless of the category, it can be asylum seekers, refugee, can be international students, as we have seen with this uh, Vishma Sandamali's case, the Sri Lankan woman who died in the detention center, the category are also fluid, right? So if you are an international student, that unfortunately doesn't mean that you cannot become an asylum seeker one day. So this uh, type of acceptance and shared responsibility is something that I thought uh, would be important uh, for the social consensus to the presence of refugees and understanding of their contribution. Uh, however, also recognize that social license can be a controversial term because it was used in mining industry to justify it for local communities. So I'm not insisting uh, on this specific term, but I would like to hear your thoughts and maybe I can just keep this slide here. So it's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so a fascinating presentation. I'd now like to open up for some yeah. questions and answers, please. So, um, would anyone like to start off with a question for Pauline? Yes, Bye. Um, I guess you mentioned Japan is kind of uh, the main country that's been targeting Okay, so just, just for our um, audience online, if you couldn't hear. So that, I think the question, just to summarise, and or, or you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the, uh, the question is essentially asking, why is it that if Japan has all these provisions and, and uh, legal framework in place for dealing with refugees, why is there no backbone to that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Should we take more questions or should I deal with questions one by one as, as they come? Sure. Should we, does anybody else have a question they want to raise immediately, or should we get an answer to that? No, okay, so let's go to that, let's answer that question and come back from it. Yeah, thank you so much, first of all, great question. Uh, indeed, I also see it as a hypocritical situation, and uh, primarily the first uh, answer that uh, comes to mind as, as for why it may be so is unwillingness from the conservative politicians who are at power in Japan, who have been in power for decades, uh, to change the situation because accepting refugees and asylum seekers, as I was trying to show, it's not just about them as a small category, it's about changing the immigration policies in general, treating migrants differently. First of all, recognizing that they are in Japan, it's not homogeneous society, as you know, still very often you can hear it's no longer probably a mainstream narrative but 
still, you know, uh, in, in a way it's true because uh, if we compare the number of foreigners in Japan and in the UK or in Australia, and then of course you, we see different numbers, however, neglecting those, I believe right now it's 2 million people, something like this, uh, would be also, you know, why neglect them? And those are foreign born uh, nationals that are living in Japan. Now, uh, if we count all the domestic diversity, including people from Hokkaido, I know, right, or Yuku, or uh, Korean, Chinese who have been there for as a permanent residence, at least since World War II, or maybe earlier than that. So if we count all these people, then of course you see a much more diverse picture, and it just doesn't fit this uh, narrative. However, uh, for some people, this uh, is a very cherished idea. And uh, unfortunately, um, those people are still at power. <laughs> so this is not uh, something I would say that is shared by large masses of population. Because again, we will have two chapters in the book, uh, one on the public opinion on in Taiwan and one in Japan. And uh, it shows a very detailed uh, data of uh, how people perceive different groups. Uh, to what extent they are willing. And generally we, we see, uh, you know, that they are quite accepting. Uh, most of them are either positive or neutral. And the number of people, of course, there are people who are against migrants and they exist in every single country. Uh, but if you look at the data, it doesn't support these conservative policies and uh, very, very um, protectionist policies that are currently in place. And there are tiny changes so I wouldn't say that it's just set in stone and never changes. However, the changes are really, really slow. You may have heard, I didn't mention it in the slide, but you may have heard that uh, Japan has revised the immigration uh, bill and that includes, of course, provisions for the refugees. The revisions were, again, contested by so many organizations, including Amnesty International, because uh, on the one hand, they had this... Uh, good intention to reduce this limbo situation of waiting. In the past, you could apply for asylum indefinite number of times, but now they reduced it up to three times, I believe. So after the third and successful application, basically you are deported. And that is what, uh, you know, uh, uh, caused this indignation of uh, um, international uh, human rights organizations because they said, well, basically that is against the convention that you signed, right? Because if you deport people to the place where they may be, uh, their life may be at risk, then it's definitely directly against the uh, convention. However, the argument for it was that uh, that reduces the limbo situation. That is actually for their protection. So the revision, again, was very, very controversial. There was uh, this push, including from uh, some people in the government, to uh, reduce or even abolish detention practices. And that was uh, definitely the in the aftermath of all these protests, because there were protests in uh, all major cities, in Tokyo, in Osaka, people marched and protested against the treatment of uh, refugees and asylum seekers. So I wouldn't say it's completely static, but it's definitely not changing to the extent that uh, it would be required. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Professor Mimonov, go ahead. Thank you, Paulina. Very interesting. I learned a lot. Um, I had heard about Vishpa's case mm -hmm. on social media, mm -hmm. so I wasn't aware of all the implications. My question is more general. Um, I think in answering the first question, you mentioned some of the cultural, mm -hmm. if we can call them that, yeah. uh, reasons for Japanese decision makers' reluctance mm -hmm. to um, apply the standards that they expect from others uh, domestically. <coughs> and I'm a bit, um, you know, if I may question that a little bit and mm -hmm. say, if we place this in the broader global context, even countries that have been for decades mm -hmm. more open than in fact, shall we put it that way, to uh, immigration, uh, to refugees and asylum seekers traditionally, are facing massive backlashes from domestic populations, um, from some right 
working groups mm -hmm. who have actually uh, raised the money adequately in some European countries. And so politically, but also economically, mm -hmm. there, there must be an, a, an economic angle onto this where, on one hand, you know, uh, these, these, all of these developed countries, even the UK now is an aging society. And when it comes to aging society, you can't beat Japan. Uh, well, maybe South Korea can beat Japan, but Japan is up there. Mm -hmm. uh, so even the UK is an aging society, and with very recent, I don't know if you've been following, very recent announcements of this government, where in this UK, in this country, where they uh, two days ago I think uh, came up with a decision to ban all dependents of care workers mm -hmm. coming to the UK. So they, they decided to ban care workers from bringing their dependents into the UK. Earlier, a couple of months ago, there was a decision to, to ban all international students from bringing in their dependents to the country. So uh, I would put what Japan is doing into broader context. Obviously, we are Japanologists and we look at Japan and we we tend to look at Japan as a very spe specific, interesting case. But my question then, probably long question, sorry, would be, doesn't it compare, well, not compare, but like if, if we place it in a, in a global context, even just say comparing it with this country, I don't see it's that, that surprising. So how would you uh, look at that? I'm not saying it should be like that, but just broader context. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I think uh, Dr. Mumino's voice carries very nicely and he sat near the front. So I hope that everyone heard that. Um, if, you, if you're listening online and you're not able to hear any of these audience questions, please do pop a, pop a note in the chat and I'll try and pick that up now so that we can make sure that everybody who is tuning in can listen. Thank you. Can we see the chat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably start <laughs> answering the question. Definitely it's a great idea to put uh, the case of Japan and probably the case of Taiwan for the same uh, uh, reason in the global context and see it in the um, this rise of the right wing and, and generally kind of backlash against the uh, this big tendency for globalization and you know uh, acceptance of migrants and more liberal policies and now it's more towards the conservative side so perhaps it's some kind of spiral and economically definitely we see it uh, kind of a difficult balance because on the one hand it is true that uh, refugees and asylum seekers, if they are uh, successfully integrated, they will uh, contribute to the economy at some point. However, at the beginning, especially if it's a, a big uh, numbers of people and coming uh, quite fast, as fast as uh, pace, if uh, there is a humanitarian crisis, a war happening somewhere, that's what's happening. And uh, definitely uh, that can create a lot of uh, not just popular fear, but also quite understandable concern. How are we going to deal with it? Uh, you know, at the... Oh, it's all I can see. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, how are, are we going to deal with it in the short term? How are we going to uh, cope with it as a society with this huge uh, challenge? Uh, so, yes, I, I would tend to agree that it definitely reflects these global uh, processes to, so, uh, to some extent. Uh, however, it's also true that Japan has always been a little bit more conservative, a little bit more on the conservative side. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, good reasons why we may, uh, you know, cultural reasons, as you mentioned, just the, the fact that uh, it's a small country, right? So they are thinking of relatively small uh, compared to something else. They want it even smaller. Uh, so that, that may be another concern. To what extent is a valid concern? Really hard to say. I would probably leave the question to the floor. Uh, very interesting to hear what other people are saying. Uh, what the survey shows, the large scale survey that I mentioned, is that the response to refugees, uh, it actually also reflects uh, global tendencies. The response to refugees and in Japan reflects, uh, um, it depends on the demographic, basically. The younger people are the more 
willing they are to accept the older and also dependent on the education level so less educated people tend to respond in a more like hostile way and people who i think on gender as well there's a like women a little bit more but there's so many nuances to that because uh what our authors did was a traditional survey, traditional online survey so basically the type of survey where, uh, where you pick options uh, well, if uh, you do something called video treatment, for example, you show people different pictures, uh, different videos, sorry, showing different um, people as refugees and asylum seekers. And uh, those who showed uh, pictures of young men, uh, that was a case of Syria, they received the lowest uh, response. And those who showed women received a little higher and women with children highest. So, you know, it's sort of doesn't make very much sense rationally, right? Uh, but it, it reflects how people people's responses are very emotional on that and not very rational, in fact. So I don't have one good answer, to be honest, to this question, very complicated one. We tried to deal with it as best we could, uh, but at the moment, I, I don't think uh, there's just one clear answer because if there was any, I believe we could solve the problem easily but probably not not at the moment thank you uh more questions from the floor yeah go ahead Mary. so obviously much of the developed world has been a rise of right-wing populism part of that can be focus on immigration refugees and asylum seekers in politics around the world but it's kind of two part question one is that uh, does that right as prominent in the, as it is in the rest of the world, or is it still relatively, is it leveraged by public? Thank you. Thank you. So the, so the question is, is Japan part of a current phase of right-wing populism rising universally? And the second part of the question is, is, is that is that, is that an issue for, for Japan, would I say? Uh, thank you so much. So I am not uh, necessarily an expert on this topic per se, uh, of the right wing uh, populist. I mean, but what I uh, can tell you is based on what I just observed in the cities of Kyoto, where I live in the cities of Osaka, even to uh, in the streets, sorry, sorry Osaka, uh, where I often go. Uh, yes, definitely, you can see on a specific day, uh, days a lot of people from those right-wing conservative parties, some quite extreme, advocating against foreigners quite openly. And there are some Japanese people who are particularly younger generation, when they see them in the street, they try to walk away as far as possible. To, uh, and I remember talking to one of them and said, I don't want to be seen with them. I don't want to be even associated. So it's not that they are, uh, uh, you know, enjoying the huge support of the mainstream population i would say the opposite however there are people who listen to them and probably you have heard that there have been for decades uh, even literature specific publishers uh, specifically targeting certain groups like chinese and korean and they published something called ken q ken, uh, ken something i forgot so that was really shocking for me so they actually existed you know uh, entire publishers uh, publishing literature like that. Uh, so it, it hasn't been a very recent phenomenon. However, uh, that definitely was uh, picked up. And I would say they, uh, I, I don't listen very much to their rhetoric, but what, uh, they pick up, they don't advocate necessarily against refugees and asylum seekers in Japan, but they advocate against foreigners in principle. And uh, so foreigners is first point. And second, they often a point to look what's happening to Germany, look what's happening to Europe. So it's always pointing to someone else and look how they are suffering, they are losing their... There were some comments in uh, like this in the qualitative parts of the survey as well, in Taiwan as well. So people started to look what's happening in those countries, they are losing their national um, character or whatever, and they are... Uh, and that can happen to Taiwan or that can happen to Japan as well. So. Yes, in a way, yes and no, because probably there's not been huge waves of incoming asylum seekers, so it's not so much uh, at the top of policy agenda. However, I would say 
definitely there is an atmosphere being prepared for uh, for this to happen. So right wing parties are quite active, especially in certain cities uh, where they in, enjoy more uh, you know electoral support. Thank you. Um, we still have a little bit of time left for one, two more questions, particularly if anyone online would like to post some questions. Um, and we still have uh, maybe, maybe we have one more from the floor as well. Don't think we have any. I guess basically the reverse of my earlier question, where it's more about why I think Russia is something that's nationally going um, domestically rather than why they not domestically going. I couldn't hear very well the second part. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, basically, I guess the reverse of my earlier question was more about if they won't do it domestically, why are they pushing it internationally? Mm. Right, so the question is, the question is um, why is it if Japan will not uh, deal with refugee policy appropriately domestically, why are they pushing those norms internationally? Uh, thank you. Again, no, probably very simple answer to that. The most obvious answer is that uh, the concern about international reputation, about international prestige is quite strong in the case of Japan. But I, I do believe that there is uh, genuine, uh, you know, compassion to uh, whenever some kind of disaster is happening or uh, there has been a re recent um, couple of years when the uh, war in Ukraine started to happen and there was a lot of, uh, you know, media campaign, media representation of Ukrainians were very positive and uh, people were responding in a quite positive way. The number of donations that were collected were very high. So in, in that sense, uh, there is some degree of sincerity. However, I still notice that, uh, let's say, not even in the case of refugees, in the case of any other cause, uh, let's say environmental issues, uh, very often when I walk in the streets of Kyoto, I can see some environmental organizations with two different campaigns going on in parallel campaigns. And one of them is against, uh, let's say, dog meat somewhere in Korea, Vietnam. A lot of people stop by, a lot of people uh, look at those pictures, interact. And the second one is against dolphin show and dolphin slaughter in Taiji Bay. And most almost no one stops by and people just try not to look at this and it's very very interesting you know if you could film this same people same organization but two different campaign the only difference to me is that uh, pictures look actually quite similar a lot of blood suffering animals but uh, you know uh, the only difference is this is happening in our country and this is happening somewhere else so why not look at something happening somewhere, we will feel probably a little bit better. Uh, on the human level, it's very understandable. However, you know, uh, as a policy level, it's quite problematic. Thank you. I might just try and abuse my position as yes. chair here and ask one question myself. We've, we've obviously had a lot of questions on Japan. I, I'm also very interested about the comparison between Taiwan and Japan, which is so central to your, your work. So my question really is, you, you mentioned the pragmatism of Taiwan to avoid, um, let's say, antagonizing mainland China. So would it be fair from your research to characterize Taiwan's approach as pragmatic? And if we were being diplomatic or politically correct, Japan's approach as cultural? Um, or is there something else to those two approaches? Thank you. Very interesting question and uh, lots of food for thought for us as well because the book is still not published so we may uh, be able to make tiny little changes so I'm very very interested in this uh, feedback and uh, I had a chance actually to present uh, on a very similar, not exactly the same presentation in uh, September in Leiden University in the IR department, IR center. So they ask a very similar question as well. Uh, and uh, they felt, because I shared, it was a little bit differently uh, done, I shared the introduction to the book with them, the, the current draft, and it was like a, a chapter for discussion, basically, for everyone. And uh, a lot of people said that uh, you emphasize the threat to national security and this kind of pragmatic approach that you referred to a bit too much. And it, while it may be persuasive in the case of Taiwan, it's not so persuasive in the case of Japan. That's why we started, you know, shifting the narrative towards the social, cultural uh, kind of um, norms. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, you know, 
deep down, I'm not entirely satisfied with this argument. It's not very easy for me to understand why politicians may be doing something that actually goes against their national interest, if we think about it, right? So this kind of very restrictive refugee policies. And if they are, even if uh, we mentioned, for example, uh, being concerned about uh, national uh, reputation, but if we are so concerned, then why do you do things like, you know, uh, human rights abuse and detention and that are definitely against the uh, reputation of the country? So no specific answer for that. Still, very, very, very interesting. Thank you. Okay, oh, I think we are just about out of time. So all that remains for me to do is to once again ask everyone to thank our speaker in the normal way. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Thank you very much indeed, and I look forward to seeing you all at the next PAL and CGS seminar. <laughs>